Welcome to A Problem Squared, the podcast dedicated to solving your problems. If podcasts were Australian cities, then this show would be Perth. Sure, we're not filled with cool nerds and musicians like Melbourne or Infinite Monkey Cage. And we're not as well known as Sydney or no such thing as a fish. But we do have a larger population than you'd think. And a lot of them are Brits. Your hosts are Matt Parker, whose total online following is roughly the population of my hometown of Adelaide. And I am Beck Hill, whose total online following is roughly the same population as Barbados. Oh. Yeah. I've got an Adelaide. Sounds worth way of more impressive than it is, but it just turns out that Barbados is a lot smaller than Adelaide. You get a whole country. <laughs> I know. I, I, get, get... I could have found a country for you, but I was like, nah. <laughs> I get the smallest city. That's a bit terrifying, imagining all of Adelaide following me. But it is like if you're like walking home. Exactly. I'm like, what's that noise? Turn around, Adelaide. <laughs> oh, heaps good. Oh, yeah, that's all of them. a nice coffee. Oh, fruit chocks. That's, that's what yeah. the noise would be. Very specific to Adelaide. In this episode... I find which names are the least elemental. I counter someone's question about counterclockwise. And we'll open the AOB briefcase to see what's inside. Mm, I hope it's business. It might be. <laughs> Other business. <laughs> Not the primary business. <laughs> no. Matthew! Rebecca. How have you been since I last saw you? Last time I saw you, you were in Australia. And now I'm in the UK. And you've kind of got two options here, Beck. I can talk mm. about, obviously, the transition of changing continents, hemispheres, and weather systems, or we go straight into the stump date. Oh my gosh, yes, give me more stump date, please. <laughs> okay, everyone, it's stump date time, so for people we who are unfamiliar with we this- We need a musical sting for stump date We now. need something for stump date. Stump date! Send in your stump date stings. So the shortest version of, of the background you need to fully appreciate this stump date, there was a stump, my family burnt the stump, <laughs> I because of the pandemic, I couldn't partake in this. Miraculously, we dug up- part of the stump root system and I was waving it around and it was roughly the size of a milk carton let's say like a big chunky bit of bit of root mm. and we asked people to send in offers or suggestions of what to do now with this hunk of jarrah root and I was like oh I'll bring it back to the UK we can then get people to turn it into I like, know coasters or something now the stump date is I do not have the stump with me here what? in the UK and Why? the stump is now in a slightly different form. So two things happened. One was I realized that I've basically got a chunk of wood I pulled out of the ground and I can't just up and take that to a different country because what if there's like insects or something in it? What if... Yeah, but UK, I don't think the UK cares about that, does it? Well, the UK hasn't got termites or like white ants. There's no ants that eat wood over here. What? And that's really handy. Mm. So... And they did have, there was somewhere in like the Southwest where someone brought back a bit of wood from overseas and there was like a termite colony, like in one house. Yeah. And, and they quarantined the house and quite recently they've declared victory. They have gotten rid of the termite colony. Yeah. And the I savings, like the cost of having. 27 year war on termites. Is very high. Now, I didn't want to spark. Another 27-year war on ants. So I was mm. like, I can't just bring this lump of wood back into the UK without making sure there's no critters in it. So I looked up how to sanitize wood that you want to put. Actually, I, the most helpful resources were for putting it into a reptile enclosure. So if you want to give oh, your yeah. lizard a stick, mm. you want to make sure it's a clean sanitary stick. And so basically, you've got to bake your wood at 150 degrees oh, Celsius. Oh, no. No, it didn't catch on fire. Okay. So Now, I also looked into how you meant to dry wood. Because if you're not careful, it'll split. And I was mm. like, well, this tree has been dead for decades. So mm. I was like, it's definitely dried out to the ambient sand temperature. But there's still going to be some moisture. But the thing is, it takes like days, if not weeks or years, to properly dry a chunk of wood so it doesn't crack or anything. And I was like, I haven't got time for that. I got one day. So I basically put it in the oven and very slowly brought the temperature up. But you're meant to like seal the ends 
so it dries at a constant rate from the sides. And I was like, no, no, no. Wang it in the oven, <laughs> gradually crank it up. And then I baked it for several hours at 150 degrees Celsius, making sure it didn't smell burnt at any point in time. And we did get some mild additional cracking, but nothing too bad. So it's in slightly worse shape, but now it's definitely not got anything alive in it. So in theory, it's now safe, safe to bring um, back into the UK. Okay. And um, I did just do a quick cursory glance to see uh, what the UK government have to say about bringing in bits of wood. They got some opinions. Okay. If you're bringing plants and plant-based products, open brackets like wood, close brackets. So there's no ambiguity here. Yeah. I was like, what if I can get away with it's not a plant? No, they specify like wood. Yeah. From outside the EU, Switzerland and Liechtenstein, you'll need, not you will need, you'll need, very informal, the UK government, <laughs> out of out of character, if I may, you'll, y'all need a <laughs> phytosan- <laughs> a phytosanitary certificate. And your oven didn't come with one of those? <laughs> I don't know. It does not. And <laughs> I was ping like- and print out a little I don't seat. think- uh, could, could I just write on a bit of paper? No, nah, it's cool. I baked it at 150 <laughs> degrees. So basically, I need to get a certificate from the plant health authorities in Perth to say that my my chunk <laughs> of stump is safe to come back into the UK. I've left it in a cupboard in Perth, and I don't want to go back to Perth and find the cupboard full of insects. So, Or just like there's no cupboard there. <laughs> there's just no cupboard. There's a pile of sawdust. Yeah. The, the whole apartment so, block's gone. <laughs> it's gone. So, yeah, so the chunk of stump is safe. Yeah. It's been it's been home treated. I, I couldn't bring it back to the UK. So we've got a couple options here. We can either get someone in Perth who thinks they can do something with my Jara root. And then if it's processed, I think it counts as a different category, but I don't know. Or we need to get a certificate from the Plant Health Authority. I think we start with phase one. If anyone is in Perth or Australia, I guess like, oh, I don't know. You can't even, maybe even state to state would be an issue. Yeah, Let's keep it in WA. Mm. If you're in WA and you do things with wood and <laughs> you can make something to commemorate the stump, I will send it to you within WA. If we can't find anyone, I'm back there in april this year for the solar eclipse i will will find some kind of plant expert and i'll get the certificate to bring it back into the uk where i'm sure we'll have more people who can do wood-based things um to it so there you are that's that's the stump date uh you can now that's play amazing. the the outro really, music i've decided now that what i really want is for the uh stump to be turned into a a little statuette of a, of a stump <laughs> to a like, smaller stump <laughs> yeah like an ode to the stump like uh, the whole but a whole stump you know with like roots yeah. and everything yeah, yeah 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 the whole stump I might try and find I could ask my parents for the earliest photo of the stump <laughs> <laughs> see what it looks like <laughs> can you make it look like this please like someone going yeah. into the hairdressers <laughs> like this <laughs> <sighs> alright well I'll play you out that was stump <laughs> date <laughs> And how, how, how has your stump-free life been, Beck? Ah, oh, so stumpless. It's been great. I've got done my hair. Got my hair done. You First have. time I've had it done since pre-lockdown. I was in there for five hours. Ooh. I'm naturally brunette, and I thought I haven't I haven't been blonde for a very long time. Not since I was uh, a fair bit fair bit younger. And so I was like, great, I'll go blonde. But because there's been so much dye in my hair, when they put the bleach uh. in. It went a sort of weird salmon color. And then they said, oh. well, we can sort of go a sort of pinky-ish, you know, sort of coral color. But the ends were still quite greenish. And I said, well, let's lean into it and we'll, we'll go for a whole watermelon <laughs> vibe. <laughs> so I'm feeling very summery. And it feels great. It really suits. Yeah. yeah. Like, let's say mermaid hair. It's mermaid hair. Oh, uh, oh wow. producer Lauren literally just said Snap. mermaid hair as I said that. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And it's fruit based. So it's like a watermelon style. Yeah. There's there's a YouTube channel called Internet Comment Etiquette. Eric, who runs that, got a haircut to look like a pineapple some time ago. <laughs> so, See, my haircut doesn't look like it. Like, it's not like I've been styled like a watermelon. I should I think make that clear. Me, though, I think it's... The color is, but it, my haircut doesn't look like a watermelon. 
Yeah, if you had all of it cascading down your back, that would be a, like a slice of watermelon. But it's not like I've got a big triangle cut. You know, no, like... no. Nor, nor, nor if you just got like a massive green orb around your head, like you've, you've. No. <laughs> but you could, you could arrange your hair in a triangle formation. I'm gonna try. I'm trying to. I mean, listeners can't see, but I'm literally trying to do that right now. And it never, never even occurred to me. Oh, I'm gonna try and lie down and get my mum to take a photo. All right, done. There we go. Uh, guess what? I also got a haircut. Gone for a I kiwi fruit. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, we're matching. <laughs> well, look, I'll dye your head <laughs> next time we're there. <laughs> I, mean, mm, I mean, I have shaved all of my head the same length, like beard top the works. So I like it. It suits you. Did you do your eyebrows the same length as well? <laughs> no, I didn't. But this is the lazy uh-huh. cut where I set my like the clippers to one setting and just do do everything. Do the works. But you're right. I should do eyebrows to match. Yeah. Next time. <laughs> next time. Our first problem comes from Jordan, who says, Hi, Matt, Parker, and Beck Hill. And in the names, Jordan has put in brackets the PA from Parker and the BE from Beck Hill. Interesting. You know how on Breaking Bad, the opening credits highlight the symbols of elements from the periodic table when they appear in the actors' names? Assuming that an actor's name must require an element symbol to be in it, who's the most popular actor who can't appear on it? What's the most common name that doesn't work? What's the longest name that doesn't work? And then they've signed it off from Jordan with the O in brackets from Jordan. So the problem is basically which names do or don't have elements in them somewhere. So Mm. um, I wrote a little bit of code back that can take any name or word indeed and tell you what elements are in it. Do you want to know what your options are? Oh, yeah. you got five. You can have hydrogen, classic, just the big H, hydrogen. You can have beryllium, that's B-E, or boron, Mm -hmm. just B. Brilliant. You are, people have described you as beryllium. Does beryllium have beryl in it? Because I went to the South Australian Museum today. And was laughing because it was like varieties of beryl. And I just imagined a bunch of little old ladies. <laughs> a bunch of different beryls. <laughs> yes. Yep. Um, that was the beryllium exhibition. Now, more accurately, you, you have been described as boron. So that's Aww. an option. Big old capital B. Carbon, iodine. That's it. Five of them. Five elements. Wow. That's impressive. Considering there's only seven letters. There's not many letters. You're getting a lot name. of elements. I get six mm. elements. Phosphorus, argon, potassium, er- erbium, erbium. It's like a seasoning. And <laughs> tatine, protactinium. Yeah, yeah, you do. A lot of this is going to be me mispronouncing elements. I'd like to apologize for all the chemists. That's elements at 85 and 91 that I just butchered at the end there. So I basically, I put together some very quick code that takes a, a bunch of text and just tells you which elements are in it. So now all I got to do is check all the names and see which ones do or don't have any elements in them. But actually, you know what? The first thing I did, mm. I got my old code. That Remember the five letters, words, five words, five letters, that all have 25 distinct letters? Oh, yeah. Oh, I that, still that had, popular code. I know. I still had that terrible, terrible code. But the first little mm-hmm. chunk of it is just importing the 370,000 words, like the massive yes. data set of every word. And I was like, well... I only, when I'm coding, I like to just solve one little problem at a time. So the first problem I solved was, can I write some code to count the number of elements in some text? And I was like, mm. okay, before I worry about finding names or doing any of that, I'll just see if I can attach that bit of code to my old code, which was just import every word. So I deleted the rest of the mm-hmm. terrible code, put in this new bit and ran it. Well, I can tell you which word has the most elements in it. And I can tell you all the words that have no elements in them. Which would you like first? The one with the most elements. 19 elements. Oof. And the winning word is, and this is very on brand for the podcast, mm-hmm. and I can't pronounce it correctly, also on brand, <laughs> bel- belneotherapeutics. Having a therapeutical hot bath. Oh. Yeah. Um, so specifically, it's like a medicinal hot mineral bath so like when you go to a spa and they're like hey we got this hot mineral water and you can soak in it for a while for medicinal mm-hmm. purposes if you're wondering what that's called it's bell 
B A L, not Bell, sadly, B A L, Ball. Oh. Ball Neo Therapeutics. Now, there are actually, um, there are seven words that all have 19 elements in them, but that one is the shortest. So, oh. uh, as in like, because I was like, it's easy to have more elements if you've got more letters. So, I think the word that should get the credit is the shortest one because yes. it's doing more Agreed. with less. Okay, I'm just going to paste them on the chat so you can see them. There they are. There's all seven words that contain 19 elements each. They're all awful words. I do like tetrabromofluorescine. There you go. Or pseudopathogenesis. Pseudopathogenesis? I like yeah. it being suede based though. The word cosine has 10 elements in it. 10 elements? Yep. In fact, it's equal shortest word for 10 elements, cosine. And there's no shorter word with 10 elements in it than cosine. That's cool because cosine, cosine is working real hard. Has Carbon. less letters. It's got, in terms amount. of letters, C N O N E S I S C O I N I O S. There's nothing. Ooh, is nothing is not pulling its weight there. That is like getting all the meat off the bone. So every pair of letters in cosine is an element, and all the letters individually are elements apart from oh. E. So that that's as good so as you can So cosine. C O S I N E. So is that a like a trigonomic function? Got it. Not 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 cosigning on a document, cosigning on an angle. Yeah, yeah. Right. So then I also went and found all the words that don't have any elements in them, and the longest word that doesn't have a single element in it is well, th- there's two tied for first place: dead melt and mm-hmm. deleaded. Deleaded. Not a single element. Even though it's literally got the word lead in it, which I think is very funny. Ha! That is great. Okay, so now we get down to names. I found an adequate looking database of names and I ran it through and it spat out a whole bunch of names. So I did a database of first names first, like Gemma. Gemma with a J doesn't have um, any letters in it. Yep. Gemma with a J hasn't got any elements in it. Mm. And these are the names of the actors who are in it or just no, people's names? This is just people's names. So then I was like, okay, I can't, oh. I can't just keep... I found a file that was like every name ever and I ran it through and it was super unhelpful because number one, I don't think it was every name ever. And secondly, I now I'm like, but I don't know who are actors. So I, then I was like, right, I'm going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to run through the name of everyone who's ever worked on Breaking Bad. So I went to IMDb mm-hmm. and I got the 1,226 credited or even uncredited, but they worked on it names now there are some duplicates mm-hmm. in there because some, some people which did sounds more. like a lot but that's not just the cast yeah. that's like no, that's everyone cameras design writers and, music yeah. yeah you name it Runners, and some people have been boys. credited in different ways across different episodes so there are duplicates in there yeah. as well but they're all names associated with every episode of breaking bad i then ran all those names through the code to see if there's anyone they'd ever put on the show which didn't have an element in their name? And the answer is no. Every single name ah. that's ever appeared on Breaking Bad has had an element in it. The worst case, the absolute worst case, was a stunt performer who was only in two episodes named Joe Ordaz. And Joe Ordaz only has oxygen. You can choose first name or second name. It's oxygen in both cases. They are ah. the only person who worked on Breaking Bad that only has a single possible option for their element. They have to have oxygen. I feel like we need to tell Joe. That Joe, yeah, we Joe need to Ordaz. Find Joe and tell them. You're as close close as anyone came. Um, and then, yeah, everyone else. Everyone else has a name. So finally, I'm like, okay, I'm my goal here really is just to work out who's the most famous person who wouldn't be allowed to have been on Breaking Bad because their name hasn't got a single element in it. And so I went to IMDb, which is the internet movie database, and you can download their data. Not all of it, but different. But they will let you download a list of every single person mentioned on the website. And so I downloaded <laughs> or 12,218,507 oh people who have been credited on anything. I then went through those 12 million and a bit names and spat out all the ones that didn't have a single element in them. So I now have all 1,565 names on IMDb that do not have an element in their name. The data is not good quality, though. 
Like some of them are like single digits. One of them is 100%, like 100% sign is the is name. Is their name? Yeah, apparently 100% has worked in the camera department <laughs> on some <laughs> on some films or TV shows, right? And there's like, the data is a mess, but <laughs> it's like a mess in that there's a bunch of entries that are a bit ridiculous, but it it's not a mess in that it's missing names. Like I did a quick search for a bunch of people and they were all in there. So I feel like... It's, it's just cast a very wide net again. But the issue is, I don't know how I can kind of sort through this data to find out who are the most famous or most prominent actual actors because but this is the free data you get. You would need you can get a pro account for IMDb and that gives you like star ratings, but I couldn't be bothered doing that. Couldn't be bothered or, you know, don't need it. I, I think you'll find that people who are on television a lot, Matt, tend to have professional accounts. Oh, <sighs> Oh, really? You've got a... Prof- Wait, have you got one? Or are we on different sides of the famous enough to have a professional IMDb account line? <laughs> Nuts. Am I even on IMDb? Am I in that... Da- I better be in that. I didn't even check to see if I was in the data set. Oh, there I am. I'm listed writer stand-up maths. Oh, my goodness. Lucy's in here, too. <laughs> there we go. Hey. Here we are. Matt Parker. Very out-of-date photo there. Thank you. I've got hair. Oh, uh... So in the top right, you've got the IMDb Pro star meter, and then it says C rank. What is it? Is like, is it a number value? What have I got? Yeah, so I think it's ranked you out of the other people. Okay, I want I want my star rating. I want Lucy's star rating, and I want your star rating. Let's get to the bottom of this. So Lucy, Professor yep. Lucy Green, her star meter is three hundred and sixty-six thousand six hundred twenty-three. Right. She's in almost the top third of a million of all stars. You are Uh 350,264. Oh my goodness. I'm a trivial amount more famous than my wife. Hey, you're well within the margin of error. 16,000 ahead of her. (laughs) It's not much. Uh, This guy, 96,391. You were top 100,000 celebrities in the world. Wow. I'm not sure. <laughs> I have that. never been starstruck in your presence until now. That's, oh my goodness, top 100,000. <laughs> also like, known for oh. fruit-based hairstyles. Boom. Oh, I've gone down 22,000 this week, apparently. What? Mm-hmm. I guess that's when um, Make Away Takeaway was on TV, I guess. The series came out in October. And then it jumps up, so maybe it was a while for the uh, data to come in. There's some fun uh, graphs, actually. In fact, Ooh. I'll see if I can look at your graph. some graphs, yeah. Ooh. Oh, my God. I, you know, I, I go up and down, but I'm not straying too far from that 300,000 line. <laughs> Last 12 months, down 100,000. Aw. There can't be many careers where you get an actual plot of when you were at your peak and now it's all downhill. No, <laughs> that's true. Uh, so, Matt. Yep. I can look up how your star rating has gone ever since you were first listed oh my goodness something oh, on, wonder, uh, when was my heyday movie database i'll be able to look back and see see when i made it to the top and back down again <laughs> yeah they say you rank uh 300 000 in the world twice in your career once on the way up <laughs> once on the way back down you're pretty solid thank you lucy's has a big old jump really you know, hers is like in the million, in the one million mark, and then she gets to 2018, and form. She That's was in the weird. top 100 for a while. She hit top 40,000. Look at her. And so, I've sent mine as well, which, which just looks like um, I, I won't, I won't lie. It looks like I'm on the way up. As of sometime in 2021, you've been you've been hovering pretty solid in the oh. top 100,000. Well, Beck, now that you're yeah. logged into Pro, you've actually solved one problem for me. Because what I did was just go through and eyeball all the names that were in my um, IMDb database who haven't got an element in their name to see if any famous mm-hmm. people jumped out. And two did. So there are two famous okay. people in the data. And they are Adele and Mr. T. Both Adele right. and Mr. T have no elements in their names. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I think... Adele is more famous than Mr. T. <laughs> now, don't don't encourage me to pity this foolish behavior. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, I feel like people are going to have strong opinions in different directions. I'm going to call it Mr. T, but arguably Adele is more famous. 
at least during the era when Breaking Bad was on. So it should get the title, but I don't know. Who knows what algorithm generates the star meter? You know what? For fun, I'll show you uh, Mr. T's full uh, full graph. <laughs> Do. There you go. That's a pretty consistent career. Now, all only goes back until the late 90s. And I feel like by then, um, you know, that's after the A-team and other bits and pieces. So Yeah, yeah. But even, even in the early 2000s, hit the top 50. That's amazing. So the solution to Jordan's problem of who's the most popular actor who can't appear on Breaking Bad, it's Mr. T. <laughs> Which is such a shame, because that would have been a great episode. <laughs> it would have been. Maybe at the very end of the episode, they would have had just a, like a, a little bit, I would discuss a lot of things about drugs in this episode, kids. Don't forget to say no to drugs. And that's when they bring in yeah. <laughs> That's what that show was missing. Yeah. Well, I'm very impressed, Matt, and I think that definitely deserves a ding. Is there any elements in ding? There are three. Nitrogen, indium, and iodine. Hmm. Elementary, dear Matt. (laughs) (laughs) We have a very concise problem in from Dimitri, who went to the problem posing page at a problemsquared.com and said, Why do clocks run clockwise? Were there ever clocks running anti-clockwise? Right, Beck, you've got a spin on this. Yes. I mean, well, firstly, I would argue that te- if it's a clock, always runs clockwise. But, you know, that just is yeah. suggesting yeah. that it, the direction it's it glib. goes, that is clockwise. It's glib. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but why do they sort of circle from the top going left to right and the bottom going right to left? Yeah. I feel like clock direction's pretty standardized. Yes. Yeah. And there's a really sort of simple answer, really. I haven't been able to find anything oh. in my research that suggests otherwise, but it appears to mainly be because the clocks that we're used to were invented in the Northern Hemisphere. And that's where sundials would run with an arc going from left to right. Huh. So they were already used to that motion. So it just made sense that that is the direction that a clock would go. Interestingly, in Bolivia in 2014, the National Congress building in La Paz received a new clock that has hands that move anti-clockwise. Oh. And just as a way of saying, well, we're in the Southern Hemisphere, so... You know, we're going to do it. The, this is how we should do it. Other yeah, yeah. And I uh, I rate that. I think that's really cool. There are a few other notable clocks that run uh, counterclockwise. One of them is Paolo Uccello inside the Duomo. I think it's Uccello. Double C in Italian. I always can't remember. It's either Uccello or Uccello. Oh, yeah. Look, mm. it's the podcast where we can't pronounce things. We know this already. That one's really fascinating because it runs counterclockwise, but it also was before 12 hours were assigned to morning and night. So it would just run from sunrise to sunset. That was the only time we run because it was like, that's the only time you need to know time. That's all you need. Yeah. And that was mainly for religious practices and agricultural. I feel like at that point, it's less a clock and more just an arrow pointing where the sun is. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, you're getting pretty close to Sundial Town around the, around that. It's over there. Yeah. It's up there now. It's over there now. It's down there now. And See you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> yeah. And in Prague, the Jewish town hall has two clocks. One is your, your standard Roman numerals running clockwise. The other one has Hebrew letters on the dial and runs counterclockwise. So uh, they think that, again, that comes down to religious practices, the way that the... Temple priests would proceed counterclockwise around the periphery. It's also the Torah is marched counterclockwise. Have you ever seen a clock going backwards? It looks weird. We're so used to seeing clocks going the way that they go. Uh, If you see a backwards clock, it genuinely messes with your head. I'm pretty sure I saw somewhere like um, in a hairdresser's having backwards clocks, like mirror, totally mirror image clocks behind you so you look at it in the mirror is the right way that's so clever that's like how ambulance always has it backwards it used to throw me as a kid (laughs) that's you know when i first came heard the problem my initial thought process was this is gonna be one of those arbitrary things like and i honestly thought it's not like the solar system has a dominant 
rotation direction. Like if you view the solar system from the down from the north mm. hemisphere, er, pretty much everything in the solar system goes anti-clockwise. And so I was like, oh, it's not going to be like if you, the solar system's anti-clockwise viewed from above. It's going to be something a bit more arbitrary. But it turns out, no, it's literally that. It's because we're rotating counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. That means, because that, that's what gives us the apparent motion of the sun, means that sundials go clockwise, and that's where we got our clocks from. So the direction of clocks rotating is because of the dominant angular momentum that came from the protoplanetary disks. That's good. That's good to know. Good answer. Yeah. That's exactly how I was going to say it too. Sorry, I sorry I stole your wrap up. There you are. <laughs> yeah. Well, there were some other suggested theories, but I didn't think they stood up as much to that one. Some people right. thought it went back to the I cuz obviously the terms clockwise and counterclockwise didn't exist before clocks. No. It they were just called wise and <laughs> counterwise <laughs> and counter. Yeah, anti-wise. It was anti-wise. The closest they had to it was... So they, they would tend to ha just have left... Going from left to right or right to left. That was kind of the more... You know, because there was no reason other than saying circling. Yeah. They There was a record of them... The term Widdishans, which ca comes from Scottish, I believe. And Widdishans would mean counterclockwise. And that was the idea that you were sort of walking left around something. And that was seen as quite evil. <laughs> So um, there was a, an now the old sinister yes, there was an, an account of a woman who was being tried as a witch because she was walking widdishans around houses. So she was just walking left around the houses. I mean, doing doing notoriously witch things. I'm sure of it. Yeah, Turn yeah. Ooh, that was uh, one of the other reasons that people thought it might be because you don't want a clock to be going left because left is evil. And right is good. And in fact, I never even realized this. The reason we say right to mean correct comes from the term that le left is seen as bad and oh, really? so right is seen as, as good. Right is So when right. we say right, we genuinely are saying it's, it's facing that way, facing that direction. Now, I prefer the angular momentum of the solar system argument over the humans are ridiculous and can somehow form opinions and meanings to turning left or right. Yeah. I want to live. I'm going to live in the first first. Well, you know, world. the Latin for left is sinister. Yeah, I made a sinister gag. Oh, a sorry, ago. I was too busy trying to remember all my facts. <laughs> no, no, worries. it's one of the many non-hilarious jokes I scatter, hidden throughout the podcast. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there you go. That is uh, that's the answer. Wow. There's your little wing ding. Well, your on, behalf, ding on behalf of Dimitri, you get yourself a mini yes. ding. Ding. Hey, Matt. Yes, Beck. Do you want any? Any what? Any other. And what? In addition to something? Any other business. Oh, business. <laughs> so, two episodes ago, I predicted we would hit one million downloads on the 11th of yes. January. And I recorded that in advance of this mm. happening. It went out after that happened. And so for the people listening, this is now old news. They've known about this for two episodes now. But we, living in the past, have just realized that I was correct. We hit 1 million downloads sometime around 7.30 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time on the 11th of January. Yay! So... I was correct down to the day. Very and I'm proud. sure it had nothing to do lucky. with you and I pushing it on Twitter and being like, hey, everyone, we've nearly hit a million downloads. Nah, we were we were rolling towards it at the time. <laughs> I'm confident. I mean, maybe I factored that in, you know. There sure. You so I refreshed it at 7.45 p.m. and we had tipped over by then. So that's why I'm saying it was about 7.30 p.m. So I'm very, very proud of that prediction. Yeah. Which means... That my subsequent predictions are also um, very course. likely to be true as well. So that's good to know. Oh, fingers crossed. So, in theory, two million downloads in November. Let's Bring find it out. on. We heard from Bennett, who uh, sent us the question about what are the similarities between Perth, Scotland and Perth, Western Australia. Yeah, Taylor 2 Perths. And they said, although you made my problem undingable, 
despite the number of bells in your answer, I appreciate the work you put in. Oh, well done. I've become a Patreon. Oh. Thanks, Bennett. Oh, that's nice of them. I think becoming a Patreon is like giving a problem a super ding. Yeah, if anyone wants to super ding us. <laughs> Oof. Why does that sound wrong? It did. Well, I decided to not follow it up also, with Also, to comments. super ding us is, if you take out the spaces, that's super dingus. <laughs> Good old super dingus. <laughs> super dingus has seven elements in it. <laughs> Super Dingus should be our mascot. And it's just it's just um Some would argue it already is. Oh <laughs> who's which one is it? Is it both of us? Yeah, who knows? I think I think it's we It's not turns. Super Dingai. <laughs> there's there's no I in Super Dingai. Oh no wait. <laughs> Super Dingo. Oh no. We're we're going off topic again. No, yeah, anyway. This is any other AOB. That's not what this is all about. <laughs> And as always, we love to thank you wonderful listeners. Thank you for helping us hit one million listeners. I, I know we've already thanked yeah. you in previous episodes, but we mean it this time. Yeah. Now now you now we know you've delivered on the goods. We're very appreciative. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who shares this podcast with anyone who might like to listen to it. And of course, an extra thank you to all of our brilliant Patreon supporters who all get to listen to our bonus podcast. I'm a wizard and you can be a Patreon supporter of any level in order to get that. So we appreciate you. But most of all, we want to give a special thanks to three people chosen at random from our list of Patreon supporters. You get a nice little shout out at the end of the show. And this episode, we would like to thank Bill Merrill. Eric Herman Stadsana. <laughs> I think you got that. I think yeah, that was right. that's how you pronounce it. And Kate Sherrod. Or Sherrod. Sherrod. That, that silence there was Kate us. Kate uh, Sherrod. Was us doing charades for Kate. <laughs> it's uh, one word, one syllable, Kate. I'd also like to thank my wonderful co-host, Matt Parker. Thank you. And the population of Adelaide. Myself, Beck Hill. And the population <laughs> of Barbados. On behalf of all of us. Thanks. And the Brisbane of our show. Lauren Armstrong Carter, and that she's pretty warm, far away from both of us. <laughs> far, far away. <laughs> uh, you've been listening to a Problem Squared. Goodbye. Beck, I've got a question for mm-hmm. you. I need you to pick a song. Like just any song? Okay, I've just sent you a grid of nine songs, Mm -hmm. and you've got to choose a song. Choose a song. Ooh. Oh, it's a close one. there's some interesting choices there. But I think I'm going to go with Pump Up the Jam by Technotronic. Oh, really? I was torn between Pump Up the Jam and Under the Bridge. Me too. Those were my two. Yeah. Well, if you've claimed Technotronic's Pump Up the Jam, I'll take Under the Bridge. And... um, we have now completed question one in BuzzFeed's Which Muppet Are You quiz. Ooh. There you go. Next post credit scene, we'll do question two. <laughs> okay. Wow, this is playing the long game. <laughs> it's going to take It's gonna take a while. It'll be worth it. Imagine when we find out which Muppets we are, though. It's Come great on. because everyone else can run now. ahead and do the quiz in front of us and work out what Muppets they are. Exactly. And if they can try and work out what we are... We'll find out if they're right or not in a number of episodes' time. <laughs> Fantastic. I really hope it's Animal. Which Muppet do you think you are? I have a sneaking suspicion I'll end up with, like, Beaker or Dr. Honeydew, like one of those. I think my nerdy answers are going to bump me in the science Muppet direction. Mm, yeah, possibly. I'm, I, I mean, obviously everyone wants to be Gonzo because he's the best one. Yeah, nah. To be fair... Given one of my favourite things to do in my career is hosting variety nights, I may even. I get was Kermit. thinking you're a just, bit of a Kermit you know, from from a career point of view. If I was just gonna yeah. go straight in, I'd say that you're a Kermit. Okay. Yeah, and um, as my, I, I'd like to think I'm Gonzo, but I think I'm more uh, Fozzy Bear. I think I have to uh, tell everyone when my <laughs> jokes are happening. Uh, you're a you're a hundred percent getting Fozzy Bear. <laughs> Plus, I've got a tiny hat. <laughs>